Welcome to NPR Connects. Glad to have you here. I'm Mike Mulcahy. I'm NPR's political editor. And if you don't know who Domenico Montanaro is, you're probably on the wrong Zoom call. So uh, check your links, check your calendar, make sure you're in the right place. Regular listeners really don't need much of an introduction to Domenico Montanaro. He's on the radio a lot, especially during campaign season. You also hear, hear him regularly on the NPR Politics podcast. He's a senior political editor and correspondent at NPR. He's been with uh, NPR since 2015. Before that, he worked for the PBS NewsHour and NBC. He's also worked for CBS and ABC. So the real question we're going to try to answer tonight is how can someone so young and so good looking have held so many jobs in such a short time? Domenico Montanaro, thanks a lot for being with us. Uh, there you are. Thanks for having me. And the answer to your question is I'm a terrible employee. <laughs> well, <laughs> we, we know that's not true because we listen to you and we read what you write at, on the website. But uh, maybe you can start us off a little bit uh, with your origin story. Tell us how you got into journalism. Why political journalism in particular? Well, what's funny about that is I grew up in New York. I grew up in Queens. Uh, my dad's a gym teacher. My mom was a nursery school teacher. I played a lot of sports as a kid, but I always liked English and writing. Uh, it was a thing that I was always kind of drawn to. I did. I was a sports editor of our um, like high school paper, which wasn't like a very good paper. It was like maybe came out like once a month, and it was more screeds about things that were happening. But um, you know, I, when I wound up going to the University of Delaware, they had a very good um, twice weekly newspaper there. Um, and I decided if I was going to go away and I was going to do that, I wanted to try my hand at journalism and sports writing. And um, it turned out though, I'd always been, I mean, I'd always been a political junkie and I kind of, I didn't quite realize that not everybody is, <laughs> you know, most people kind of abhor politics and don't really want to, it's not, I mean, it isn't, it's not very life affirming. It's not something mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, I, I learned that when I went to graduate school that most of my colleagues, I thought everybody who was going to graduate school for journalism wanted to, you know, be a white house correspondent. And most of them turned out wanted nothing to do with politics, but I was the kind of person who, you know, my brother, when he turned 21, he's younger than me. Um, I went up to the University of Albany in upstate New York to, you know, be there for his birthday. But we didn't go out at all that night because he's born on November 3rd. And in 2005, when he, or 2004, when he turned 21, was the night of uh, George W. Bush's reelection. And the two of us just sat there with as many TVs as we could find on. Uh, queued to all the different channels. We had our own whiteboard going in the background, <laughs> with, you know, trying to figure out like which state's going to go where and when they could call it uh, based on the number of electoral votes that were out. And, you know, I was probably at that point like 25 or something like that. And that's just a thing I'd always, but that's the thing I'd always done, you know, I mean, whether it was that I always loved ranking things. Uh, when I was like eight years old, I made my own, you know, drew my own March Madness brackets um, and just would post them in my room and, you know, try to predict who was going to win the, you know, the races. But I was always very interested in history, um, you know, the socioeconomic and political effects of what happens geopolitically. And it was a thing that I really, I loved in high school. I wound up doing a lot of in college. And I wrote one I wrote a couple of political stories about where I wrote one story in college that, that was about the Gore Bradley debate in 2000. Uh, and I got to go up to the Apollo theater in Harlem. Um, and my professor at the time had been a former CNN uh, world affairs correspondent. And he got us into this debate. We drove two and a half hours up from Delaware to Harlem and were up there for the day. And I was just so struck by the media circus that surrounds um, you know, a political event like that, the cameras, the trucks, the rooms that are in another building across the street where everyone, no one's in the room watching right. the event, you know? So it just was so interesting. And I wrote a whole piece about that. And um, my professor was like, you know, I know you like sports, but uh, I think this is actually some of the best work you've done, which I actually took offense to at the time because I wrote, wrote like 315, <laughs> like, you know, sports, sports are one political thing. And a guy who doesn't like sports is telling me, you know, I'm doing a 
great thing with politics. But once I got past my own queens, <laughs> I settled down on that and realized, huh, maybe this is something that I could do. And uh, by happenstance, I in after grad, graduate school, I got a job as a researcher at NBC News um, after a few years as a teacher, actually, um, and teaching high school English for three years. And um, wound up going to DC and I was Chuck Todd's first hire at NBC. I was his researcher. I got to learn sort of at, you know, I think he was always one of the best analysts uh, that were out there. And I, I really got to learn sort of how to think counterintuitively about politics, how to really try to push the envelope with, um, you know, not going with the flow, which I, I think the rat, men, rat pack mentality that I think a lot of journalists have in the conventional wisdom shorthanded as CW in DC can really be a problem uh, mm -hmm. because people think that, you know, the, the narrative gets set in. So right. anyway, well, I, that's my I background. Always, I always tell yeah. young reporters, if everyone's zigging, you're, you're always better off zagging. Yeah, totally. I mean, it's one of those things, you know, I, I coached a lot of our um, embeds when I was at uh, NBC, uh, people who would go out on the trail um, and be embedded with campaigns and, you know, they always were wondering how they get the best angle, how they get the story. And, you know, it was like, yeah, you have to get the soundbite when you're in TV. You have to be in that scrum. But I would tell them if you can, whatever you can do to do some original reporting outside of that scrum, um, there's a story out there that's better than the thing that uh, is necessarily being spoon fed to us. And, yeah, we fact check, do all of that stuff. But trying to think counterintuitively I think is, um, is a really important thing. It's important to have good editors who can help you shape those kinds of stories and angles. Um, and I, I, frankly, one big reason why I love working at NPR, because you know I can go on the radio for four minutes and talk about the Senate landscape. Um, whereas at NBC, you know, that might have, you might have gotten on for a minute and a half, you know, mm. nothing, no piece was ever longer than a minute 45 on nightly news, because there's so much crunch for time, that you didn't really get deep into a lot of the kinds of things that we will do, you know, being able to do stories, for example, on campaign finance, and why I did this piece on why people can why candidates are allowed to lie in their advertisements. Um, it's just not something you can do in commercial television, a commercial radio in the way that you can uh, in public radio. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I know another thing you work on a lot is polling. Mm -hmm. And um, we had a, at least one question in advance of, of this evening, and it was my question too. Can we trust the polls now after 2016 and 2020? It depends on what you mean, you know, and what they're doing. I, we're going through a process at NPR um, of having some discussions about putting out some guidance uh, about how we should interpret polls, how we should think about them. Um, you know, survey research is um, necessary in American culture. You know, we wouldn't have known, for example, how fast public opinion changed on same-sex marriage between 2005 and 2015 if it weren't for having good, you know, longitudinal studies, you know, research surveys that went over time, had the same kinds of questions, or match to the census. I think where I am now much more hesitant and I've advised people at NPR is to sort of stay away from the horse race polls. Um, I just don't think they say a whole heck of a lot. I think people have to understand that there's margins of error and those are very real. So if a margin of error is three and a half percent, it means it could be seven points different. It could be three and a half points higher, three and a half points higher, three and a half points lower. And that's something that gets lost in the constant, you know, cable chatter of, you know, what's going on in a race. Now, what I try to explain to people, if someone you see is up in the conglomerate of polls by 20 points, you're pretty safe to say that that person um, has the advantage or has, appears to have the lead in the race or, you know, whatever way you want to phrase it that has enough um, caveats that you're being careful and you're not, I always say the, the you know a poll is a bad poll when they're giving you decimal points <laughs> because <laughs> nothing, they're not designed to be that exact. Um, right. And I really like using them to measure attitudes, uh, to, to look at long-term trends, um, and to speak in broad ways 
about surveys. Um, you know, it, it, it's like if you want to know more about how do people feel about gun control, you know, you can come up with a good battery of questions, get, get with a good pollster and uh, have a good survey sample that's going to tell you something. And if you, you know, get the same kinds of questions over and over again, um, over a long period of time, um, and you see the middle move significantly, you know that something's happening. And so I think it's, it's a more nuanced way to think about surveys. Um, it's always how I've thought about them. I worked in CBS's polling unit um, for uh, several months in 2006. So I really learned what that was like, how the questions are crafted, but it's really lost on um, you know, the top lines of uh, you know, talking on cable news shows or um, you know, uh, and it's just not something most people think about. So I'm always mm -hmm. happy to talk about surveys and sort of the best ways to, uh, to use them and not. And I think that we have to be really, really careful when, you know, something says that there's a lead in a race and, you know, it's three points or five points or something like that. Cause that's, you know, that could, if your, if your survey or your sample is slightly off, um, that's, it's, it, you know, it might not be real. And we've gone through lots of iterations and explanations for what may have happened in 2020 and 2016. Um, and there's all kinds of stuff related to that. But, you know, I think still when it comes to attitudes, measuring against the census, um, that is where they have the most value. Okay, well, let's talk about uh, specifics. I mean, a, a poll we can trust is what happened on election day. And we know that Joe Biden won with about 51% of the popular vote. Um, and if you look at that collection of polls now, he's somewhere around 40%. Mm -hmm. uh, so what happened? What, what has happened to Joe Biden's popularity? Yeah, so this is where surveys can actually be helpful because you can then talk about issues <laughs> and you can see why something got to where it has. And, you know, look, inflation is a real thing. I mean, what we've also seen in surveys is people's concern over inflation has really spiked over the past seven, eight months, where it wasn't the case when Biden took, it, took office. Leading up to the election, COVID, of course, was the top concern for people. And it's very difficult to, you know, detangle COVID from uh, inflation, but it gives us an opportunity to talk about that in a nuanced way, um, you know, and I, I think that what you're seeing here, and then you start to see the politics of it, where the president now is calling it, you know, Putin's gas, uh, Putin's inflation or whatever mm, he wants to call gas it. Gas tax. Right? Yeah. So, you know, that um, helps explain some things that are happening in the country. I, I think that he, he was dented pretty significantly it, last August with the withdrawal from Afghanistan um, because uh, it just, he ran as somebody who was competent and could run the government better than Trump could. And for a significant slice of independence who had turned away from Trump, they believed that. And then they really turned on Biden after uh, the withdrawal from Afghanistan. Now, we need to understand just because his numbers are underwater now doesn't mean that that's a poll against somebody who he would run against. You know, that those are different things. And, you know, we always, the cliche, the elections are choices. It's true. I mean, you know, if Biden were to run against Trump one more time, which looks like it's possible, if not probable, um, you bet those numbers are probably going to start out at 45, 45, just like every other <laughs> every other thing with a point or two variation here and there because of our partisanship partisanship, and what it is. So um, yeah, I, I think that that's, uh, that's part of what's happened with him. And, and that's not my sort of, um, you know, theory on this. This is, I've talked to a lot of democratic strategists who, um, you know, are seeing that in a lot of their focus groups and their own private surveys. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk a little bit about inflation. Um, new number today, eight. 8.5% in March, uh, highest since 81, I think. Um, I think 82, but close. All right, yeah. there you go. <laughs> long time ago. Yeah, long time ago. Uh, and it really seems like a, a no-win situation for any president. I mean, there's not much you can do about it. Uh, and Republicans are just hammering him every day on it. I uh, think that is, that. I think the key, one of the key things that me and my editors continue to talk about quite a bit is that there are a lot of the things that are really hurting Biden right now are out of his control. Mm -hmm. And that is incredibly frustrating for the White House. 
And understandably so, you know, I mean, the presidents get far too much credit and far too much blame for strong economies. And the White House would, you know, talk to your blue in the face about how strong the economy is in an underlying way. I mean, we're almost at full employment, um, you know, for unemployment to be where it is, is really kind of astounding. Um, wages are going up, businesses are opening back up in many places. And, you know, there are different factors for why prices are going up. And uh, part of that is businesses trying to recoup losses. Part of that is because of supply chain issues. Part of that is because some places still aren't fully uh, open and, and getting their, their, um, you know, their profits recovered and all that. So it's a difficult, sticky situation for this president where there are a lot of different things that are out of his control at this point. And he doesn't quite fire up, you know, a lot of his base voters uh, progressives in particular, generationally, who were all in for beating Trump, but not necessarily uh, all in for feeling inspired by a Biden presidency. Mm -hmm. And another thing he really has no control over, uh, it falls in the general area of inflation, is gas prices. And uh, that seems to be killing him. Uh, is there any way you see any of this turning around by November? Um, not well, okay, this November is difficult, I would think, for Democrats. I think that the landscape for Democrats in general, there's pretty much a unified you know, feeling among Republicans and Democrats that the House is going to be in Republican hands after, after the fall, and that it's trending more now that the Senate is going to be in Republican hands because of the national landscape and talking about Biden's polling numbers, places like Georgia and Pennsylvania and Arizona, Wisconsin, where Biden actually had pretty good poll numbers um, at the start of his presidency, and then has really nosedived to, in all of those places, only about a third or a little more approve of the job that Biden is doing. And that just deflates your base. It's automatically difficult for a first term for a president because the party that's out of power just more easily able to fire up their voters, because they're already angry with the president, they're angry for losing the election, whether some will admit it or not. <laughs> um, but they, so it just makes it much more, it's not trivial historical points on this. It's because, you know, really their get out the vote efforts are much more difficult when you're the party in power. And we talked about some of the things out of the president's control, but I wonder if one of the big things that sort of was in his control was setting expectations too high. Oh, I totally with agree a 50, with 50 50 Senate. I mean, it was it was a long shot he'd get anything passed, wasn't it? I I 100% agree with that. I actually did a story about that a few months ago about the expectation setting that he had done. Um, and you know, he likes to speak in grandiose ways about things. Every president wants to tout their accomplishments. I mean, President Biden and Democrats did get quite a bit done in the first year, considering, you know, what the numbers are. I mean, a 50-50 Senate where legislation still needs a 60-vote filibuster-proof majority in order to get any legislation done, you know, um, President Biden has appointed more um, judges to the federal bench than any president since Reagan. 80% of those are women. 50-some uh, percent of them are not white. Uh, which is a huge contrast to what uh, President Trump did when he was in office. Um, so there's that. Of course, the almost $2 trillion uh, COVID bill and infrastructure bills, they're massive pieces of legislation that were able to be, you know, find this unique path through, um, even though the infrastructure bill was very strongly bipartisan. You know, I mean, I remember having to cover the you know, fiscal cliff negotiations between President Obama and John Boehner, as well as the debt ceiling negotiations. And they're always talking about, we're always talking about infrastructure. Well, Boehner's people would tell me is, you know, we just can't agree on the pay fors. We can't agree on how to pay for this thing. And somehow, you know, Biden came in with the, knowing the right Republicans, understanding how to, what the pay fors were, it got done. And that's a huge accomplishment but the problem is Democrats spent so many months fighting amongst themselves about the best path forward to trying to get their social safety net bill through with the Build Back Better bill that 
you know, they had a lot of fits and starts on and, you know, it, it felt like when they got that passed that they weren't celebrating, they were kind of exhausted and relieved and were like, like fine, whatever it's done. And you had a lot of disappointed people on the left. So mm -hmm. it's, um, it's, it's a very difficult situation for, you know, uh, any president to be in. And uh, I think they could have done much better job of, ex of setting expectations. Well, what about the Republicans? Do, do they need a strong message going into this campaign or do they just have to point to the Democrats and say, we're not them, we, you know, we didn't, we didn't make these problems? Well, they are certainly banking on not needing a, a you know, proactive, positive message as far as what they would do if in office. What they're busy doing right now is pointing out the deficiencies and the flaws and the vulnerabilities of the Biden administration to say, you know, Biden's in charge, here's what inflation is, um, you know, and then rallying the base around culture issues, um, you know, be it abortion, which has been a long time thing, or be it, um, you know, uh, transgender girls in sports and schools or, uh, you know, uh, education and empowering, quote unquote, parents, uh, which we've seen them use to fire up their voters. So, you know, you can see what the legislative priorities would be if you look at the states and the state legislatures that are controlled by Republicans, um, certainly endorsed by uh, Republican leaders, but they don't necessarily, I think it's a big open question. When we do our briefing books for after the election, on what will the Republican agenda be? It's really up in the air because they were not, they, you don't hear them talking about repealing and replacing Obamacare anymore, which was the drum that they beat for, you know, almost 50 times or more that they had tried to vote on it and, and uh, didn't work. And now the law is much more positive and favorable than it had been. And Obama's name is no longer associated with it. So it's become far less partisan. Uh, and it's really not the thing people are arguing about anymore, which is kind of amazing considering it's what gave rise to the Tea Party and I would argue uh, to President Trump being where he is uh, and uh, being able to ride that energy. Well, what about former President Trump? Uh, does he help Republicans or does he hurt them at this point? So what Republicans say to me privately is that Every Republican senator should want President Trump's endorsement because he has such a key tie to the base. Uh, they need those voters to come out for them to vote, to be able to win, and especially in these places that are all very closely divided states, you know, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, uh, two Democratic targets. Republicans, though, need that Republican base, that Trump base to come out to help them. At the same time, they'll say they have to thread this needle and walk this line to run their own race, to raise their own money so that they can, in other words, try to replicate what Glenn Youngkin did in Virginia when he won the governorship there, where he accepted Trump's endorsement but kept him at arm's length. So in a purple state, in a place where Trump maybe isn't as popular, you want the base to turn out, but you don't necessarily want Trump with you 100%, you know, uh, as the as a full fledged endorsement, I think that's the that's the the um, unicorn race that they're going to try to run in some of these places. Uh, you know, Ron Johnson in Wisconsin can't escape from Trump um, because he's one of the staunchest Trump allies, and he's fine with that. He will lean into it, and he'll take his he'll take his uh, chances with that um, and not shy away from it. And you know, and but the thing is, with the environment being what it is as negative toward the party in power uh, with the historical nature of turning out voters, it might not even matter for Republicans. You know, they, there might be some really uh, untested candidates with checkered pasts uh, who don't run very good races and don't raise a lot of money who could just be swept over the finish line. Hmm. Well, it's interesting. You, you talk about Virginia and Glenn Youngkin. I mean, every Republican in Minnesota is talking about that. There hasn't been a Republican who has won statewide here since 2006. And uh, they think they have a good chance against uh, our Democratic or DFL Governor Tim Walls here. Mm -hmm. um, but, but the funny thing is that they're all competing so much. 
to run in the uh, primary, they have to go toward Trump or to, to get the endorsement. Right. But then once that endorsement is settled or nomination is settled, they're going to try to be Yunkin. And I just I wonder if that's going to be a tough uh, needle to thread. In Minnesota, I think certainly it is. And, you know, look, Minnesota is not, you know, it has a liberal reputation, but it's not, you know, as we saw, that far uh, away from Republicans having a chance at winning there. And, you know, you've had Republican governors. I mean, you've had, uh, you know, uh, independent minded governors who might not look the part of a normal governor. <laughs> <laughs> well, one in particular, <laughs> one in particular. So, you know, you can have a Jesse Ventura, you can have a Tim Pawlenty. Um, you know, there's a brand that can make it in, uh, in Minnesota as a Republican. Um, but it's probably much more in that sort of Yunkin like vein, but it, it, this is nationally you know, in any swing state, in any presidential election, in any place where you've got a win statewide in a place where there's a whole heck of a lot of voters on the other side of the aisle, um, it's really tough to go through a primary where you have voters that are as feverish as the conservative right is at present uh, to be able to go through that and then somehow make a pivot with enough time to then win over independents who might not like that um, form of uh, politics. So it's going to be a really difficult needle to thread. And I think it's going to be one of the biggest stories of this election cycle and how Republicans manage it. Uh, what, uh, what about the January 6th committee and their investigation? Uh, do you think that will move any voters or do you think folks' minds are, are made up on that? I mean, I, I, I'm skeptical that it will move a whole lot of voters. Uh, you know, Former President Trump was impeached twice, and it didn't seem to move a whole heck of a lot of his voters. Now, it did move independence, and independence moved away from former President Trump, and it made his life more difficult in trying to run and win re-election. The, net, the margins now are so slim. I mean, if you look at, and we're talking about polling, uh, the Pew Research Center, which does a really good job in you know doing very big samples, figuring out things that are really important questions like, how many people are actually undecided in this country? And what they found through their research is that it's really only like six to 9% of the country now is truly could be swayed. And everybody else is just kind of locked in. Um, and it's really about base elections and getting out the vote. So um, it can be really, really difficult to, um, you know, to get to a, a place that, um, you know, you you can make a lot of difference with a January 6th committee. You know, I mean, I was surprised that um, January 6th wasn't more of a red line for a lot of people on the right because you saw it with your own eyes. You saw it happen on TV. You know, reporters were there. Republican members were there and being targeted. Uh, Republican leaders initially spoke out against what they saw, even criticized President Trump someone that they hadn't done that against uh, for years. And then weeks later, they, you know, Kevin McCarthy in particular, who's angling to be Speaker of the House, made the gamble that in order to win, he's got to make up with Trump. And that's the, that's the bargain that, that Republicans are holding on to right now. You know, the thing is, most people don't pay that much attention to the news. So unless, I think that the January 6th committee has been illuminating and newsworthy and there are text messages and primary source materials that come out that paint a, a broader more colorful picture of what happened on that day um will it move voters I'm, I'm skeptical it'll move that many well uh the folks listening have some questions so let's uh let's turn to those uh cherry i think is the name asked uh, Recent reporting suggests uh, media is over-reporting some gloomy issues to the detriment of the Biden administration. Uh, anecdotally, uh, lots of inflation and gas price reporting, but not job creation or laws passed. Looking for your opinion on that. Is the media unfair to Joe Biden? You know, I, I think the White House certainly would, would, would argue that. It's what I was talking about before about, you know, talking about a rounder picture of what is actually happening with 
uh, you know, the economy overall, you know, the fact that the economy is expanding, I mean, re- you know, very strong GDP growth. Um, you know, I think it's difficult because uh, honestly, I think most people care about what's in their pocket and are they able to spend more? And I think that this election really and Biden's chances of winning re-election if he does run really come down to whether or not you can go out because of COVID. If when you go out, you feel safe, you know, when we're looking at crime in various cities and can you spend money in those, you know, when you go out and have the money to feel like you can do that. So I feel like that's sort of, I think getting toward 2024, the landscape, when you talk to economists, they do expect inflation to recede and they expect COVID to recede. And if those things do happen, uh, then you know, the picture may be a little different. Things change. I mean, President Obama, when he was president, he had a terrible uh, approval rating in 2011, for example, really far down below where Biden is now and or around the same. And then one reelection. How's that happen? Because things change. Environment changed, um, and it was. And he made the argument. He campaigned. He's you know w- went out there and had a had an opponent. <laughs> you know that is important. And you know, look as far as media reporting, I think it's important to keep in mind as reporters and as editors that we have to put things in the fuller context um, all the time as much as we possibly can. You know, but when people are saying that inflation is their top concern, and I think the difficulty that the Biden administration has, that any president has with gas prices, isn't like, I mean, if you think about like how much gas is, you know, it, in raw numbers, it's not that much more money that you're spending at the tank most of the time, you know, at the pump, you know, maybe it's $20, $30 more, which is not nothing, but, you know, it's not, you know, losing your job, right? Or uh, not getting an extra, that's an extra couple hours at, some, at work, right? Um, I think the problem is there's a six foot reminder every time somebody walks down the street or drives down a road of, of what prices are. I really think people would have a very hard time saying or knowing what the price of bacon is, even though that has gone up, or the price of an avocado, but they will know exactly what the price of gas is because they have this, you know, six foot sign that they see everywhere they go. Yeah, hard to miss it. Uh, let's see another question from Stephen. What do the Trump voters think the Republicans will do to solve the inflation problem? We, you, you don't hear Republicans pitching a lot of solutions. It's it's more of look at what Biden has done, right? Well, I think that what Republicans would argue, and this is what they always argue. Is and it's a, it's an ideological argument that you know I'm I, I'm not passing judgment on because there's clearly two very different views of government in this country. Should government do more? Should government do less? Right? Democrats and people on the left, for, for the most part, feel government should do more because there are holes in society that need to be filled and can only be filled by government and government intervention and help, especially for those who need that help who can't get it on their own without that intervention. Republicans and conservatives feel government gets in the way, it stifles innovation, it stifles growth. Um, and uh, you know that's why when you hear people like Ted Cruz or whatever say, we wanna unleash the, uh, or Mike Pence unleash the, uh, you know, the full effects of the American economy. That's what they're talking about. It's like reducing regulations, cutting taxes, uh, and making it easier for businesses to do what they want to do, make it easier for oil and gas companies to drill, uh, and just sort of create more economic activity. So I don't know that they even have to say what they think they would do about inflation. I think that it's the same stuff you've seen, roll back regulations, maybe cut more taxes, uh, and hope that businesses expand even more, or also hope that <laughs> it'll, by the time they take over, Inflation will already be receding and maybe did nothing to actually help it, but we'll take credit for it. <laughs> well, and, and again, it's a, it's a tough problem for the president because, uh, I mean, the, really the only lever out there to reduce inflation is held by the Federal Reserve, which is raising interest rates. And the danger there is that 
you know, it's not an exact science. They miscalculate, they go too big, and all of a sudden there's a recession. Well, there's that. And, you know, it hits people at the other end of the economic spectrum, which is borrowing. You know, if you want to take out a loan for a home, you know, I mean, we've seen housing expansion, you know, just be, especially in places where there's not that much housing, there, there's not as much inventory, especially during COVID. People are moving out further. They're abandoning cities. I think they're sort of starting to resort again and go back to those places. But politically, we've seen people move, you know, conservative Californians moving to Boise, um, you know, people moving to Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Uh, you know, and the reverse happening too. People don't want to politically, ideologically be around people that they don't think are following the science and moving toward to more, um, you know, liberal places. This is a resorting that's kind of going on right now that I don't think we're going to have the full understanding of. And I think that that's going to have big consequences for states, for economies, and for politics. Well, uh, one thing we haven't talked about yet is uh, Ukraine and the Russian invasion. Uh, again, some really tough choices for the president. Uh, he's ramped up the rhetoric. He's ramped up the uh, the sanctions, but he, he's he's not going to put American troops there. He he's not going to risk a nuclear confrontation. So the longer this drags on, what does that do? I don't know. I think it's a difficult uh, quandary because uh, you know at first his poll numbers looked like they were turning around a bit. Uh, people seem to approve of how he was doing on Ukraine around the State of the Union. And then uh, it sort of receded back on that. And I think there's a lot of frustration from people. They see these pictures on TV of people dying in the streets of atrocities that have been committed and to feel helpless, to feel like, and I asked this question of uh, Chris Murphy, who's on the Foreign Relations Committee. I said, you know, how, what do you say to people who just feel like sanctions are unsatisfying, you know, that it doesn't, do it. it hasn't done anything in the immediate term to stop what Putin is doing. And he said, I get it. Like, you know, my son asks me, you know, my child says, you know, what more can we do? And there isn't a good answer to that because there really is not the kind of um, strong support for American boots on the ground, as they would say. Um, you know, there certainly is when you see this in surveys, you know, the sort of ticking down through the options of things, people want stronger sanctions. Uh, they are OK with the United States moving more troops into NATO territory. They're OK with the U.S. in theory fighting back if NATO territory is, um, you know, encroached on. But then you ask, well, do you support sending Americans into Ukraine to stop what's happening? And the answer is no, largely. 25%, uh, I think it was the latest CBS YouGov poll, said that they were in favor of that. And it's, it's interesting to me because, and I said this to Senator Murphy too, you know, the Korean War, like South Korea is not a member of NATO. You know, this NATO litmus test was not, has not always been a thing when it comes to human rights around the world. Um, you know, Kuwait, certainly not a member of NATO in the 90s, uh, you know, Kosovo and what happened in the Balkans. The difference here, and I think if they're being honest, the difference here is that Russia has the second most nuclear weapons in the world behind the United States. And I don't think anybody quite knows how to proceed in that situation with someone as unpredictable as Vladimir Putin is. And there's lots of theories on what's right. I don't think anybody really knows. Um, I think there are some hawks that would say, you've got to fight strength with strength, and we've got nuclear weapons too. And then you have people on the left who are saying that all this talk of sanctions aren't enough sounds like warmongering, and you don't want to get involved in a war and then have people dying in Ukraine for the, from the United States. And then you have people saying, why are our boys over there, which we've heard and seen over and over again throughout American history. Okay, let me go back to some uh, questions from our audience. Uh, from Brad, uh, Domenico just uh, added a qualifier about Biden if he does run for re-election. What do you think the chances are that Biden will step aside, especially if his approval rating remains so low? You know, I, I think the issue is not going to necessarily be his approval rating. I think the issue is the Democratic bench. Um, you know, 
who else? Right. And this is a question that we've asked repeatedly. And the reason we talk about the if the qualifier is not really, you know, just because of the the, you know, the uh, approval rating. It's his age. I mean, it just is it is, you know, he said himself that if his son were alive, that he probably wouldn't have run for president and that he would have hoped that Bo would have run and that Bo would have been the one who would have been there instead. You know, it's difficult. He's approaching 80 years old. Um, he's clearly you know, his faculties are there, but he's, you know, a, he's having a harder time, you know, appearing the way he did even 10 years ago. Um, and I think that that's a difficult thing for the White House optically to push back against. Um, and, but, the, but again, the question comes back to who then, right? And Vice President Harris polls worse than he does right now. Um, Pete Buttigieg, uh, the Transportation Secretary, has had a very difficult time winning over non-white voters. And I think there would be a lot of hell to pay if he were to challenge Kamala Harris, in a vice, who is vice president, first black woman, Indian American woman to be vice president, and then challenge her and somehow win in a democratic primary. I don't think that would happen. I think in a democratic primary, you need to have black voters in particular and, I, and Buttigieg really struggled to win over non-white voters in the last uh, primary. Um, and I think that Democrats are sort of at this place where they're looking around for who could that other be, and uh, they're not coming up with very many names. Well, I'm, I'm almost certain a hand would go up if she were here, and it would be Amy Klobuchar. <laughs> you think she has you think she has any uh i think she has ambitions to do it yes. yeah well absolutely <laughs> you know, i mean she, she tried she tried last time and i laugh because i think she would appreciate your humor on that because she's actually very funny she's like strikingly like she's not somebody who comes across as funny you know in in hearings and stuff because she's very serious and all of that but uh i've met her a couple of times off um you know site and she's she's quite you know uh, she's quite funny. She likes to make jokes and laugh around and joke and all that. But yeah, I mean, I, she might run again. I think she would run again, probably if, um, you know, the field suddenly opened up, right? If President Biden said, you know, in a year from now, you know, I'm just not feeling it. I don't want to run. I think you're going to have a massive wide open field. But I think you'd have to give the advantage to the person who is number two right now mm -hmm. uh, to win that nomination. Well, uh, that'll make all our lives interesting if that happens. We'll, we'll see. Uh, let's see. Another question from our audience. Greg asks, can you comment on the apparent disconnect between conservative values and the continuing popularity of some politicians who seem to go against those values? Uh, Bobert and Gates, he says in particular. Is this a post-Trump phenomenon? He asks. I think it has to do with priorities. Um, like what I think some people will, what I've learned, obviously, with Trump is that some people will dismiss what they see as, you know, a core value, a core tenant of morality. I mean, obviously, you know, President Trump has had his host of issues when it comes to his personal lives and all of that. And the only place it really seemed to really stick with Republicans, where it was the top thing for them, was in Utah. Um, you saw him really struggle with Mormons, um, and you've seen a principal antagonist of President Trump, and it's is Mitt Romney, and it's a lot of it has to do with character and how you present yourself. Um, they're very, very different people, quite obviously. But for a lot of people, they're just like, oh, they'll cut my taxes, um, you know, and they're willing to turn the side, turn away the other stuff. But also, the what unifies the Republican Party now is culture. Culture war issues um, are the thing. You know, this, this turning point, this inflection point that we were at and are at, uh, I feel like in 2016, it was a real hinge election. And it is um, really based on culture. There's a changing, demogra de changing demography in the country. You're seeing Sunbelt uh, really uh, diversify with the massive increase in Latinos and Asian American voters. Uh, you saw that play out in the presidential election where places like Ohio and Iowa, which were 
uh, places that Democrats competed in, if not won, not very long ago, completely move away from Democrats and places like Georgia and Arizona come on board for Democrats as new states. We're in the middle of a political crack up. And as that fracturing happens, there's a lot of volatility and that volatility creates a lot of very strong emotions and people will put a stake in the ground, especially when it comes to race. And they can create all kinds of boogeymen can be created around that and about way of life. When you start questioning and telling people, this group of people is gonna harm your way of life, that, there's a, that, that can be a very charging uh, environment. Well, let's talk about uh, what might be the ultimate uh, social issue, uh, and that is the issue of abortion. Uh, there's a big case in front of the Supreme Court right now. Uh, they're likely to rule on it this summer, or maybe in June. Um, it could overturn Roe versus Wade. Uh, what do you think the impact of that would be if that were to happen? Well, I mean, just that would be massive. Obviously, I, uh, I, you know, that they, that that would, you know, shut off a massive avenue that has been available for women's public health for fifty years. Uh, that would be massive. Now, I don't actually think the Supreme Court is going to overturn Roe v. Wade. I could be wrong, but I do think they're going to continue to gut the 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 the, the premise of what the what the ruling originally was about. And I think they've been signaling that for quite some time. You could sort of get the gist of that in the Kavanaugh hearings and the Amy Coney Barrett hearings, that what's going to happen is you're going to see more and more states run by conservatives that push the envelope, that want to get to the Supreme Court, and who are going to have their you know, uh, limited access, uh, far more limited timetable for when abortions can happen. And I think you're going to see that in a very checkered way throughout the country in a very, you know, in the, in the federalist system. And I think you're going to have places, you're going to have people, you know, in a woman in Texas who might have to travel to a different state, you know, to get some, get an, a procedure done. Um, I think that that's what we're going to continue to see happening is sort of this squeezing uh of, of regulations um, to where it will be very difficult for, especially women who don't have the means to get on a flight somewhere uh, to have access uh, to abortion. Another uh, Supreme Court question from someone in our audience, Cheryl, who says, uh, what about Clarence Thomas, uh, both embracing the Georgia Senate candidate, Herschel Walker, and those texts uh, from his wife about uh, January 6th. Uh, it seems to be a breach not seen before, Cheryl says. It's, it's quite the, uh, it's, 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 it's an interesting ethical question because, um, you know, in Washington, there's a lot of people who have very powerful spouses uh, and, you know, they, both of their jobs intersect in different ways with power and politics. Um, and generally speaking, you don't hold the spouse accountable for what your spouse does, um, you know we've had plenty of examples of you know Republicans married to Democrats or vice versa. This obviously is a different level of um, potential conflict because of how just what happened. I mean, this is January sixth. This is you know a threat to democracy. I think people should see it that way. Um, you know, I, I think that she has long been. A, an activist or a firebrand or whatever you want to call. It. I mean, back her family was, um, you know, very active in kind of fringe right politics. And she's kind of continued along those same lines. I mean, I think the area for me that um, started to cross lines that weren't just your traditional spousal, you know, okay, my, my wife does this, my husband does that. Uh, was the fact that she's able to access his former uh, clerk's listserv and pass along her views about supporting Trump, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I, I don't know how, how bright the line is. I know that Justice Roberts, uh, Chief Justice Roberts, is very conscious of how the court looks, what the appearances are, how the 
trust in institutions, including the Supreme Court, have become more polarized and politicized, and he doesn't like it. Um, so I don't know what's going on behind the scenes. Um, if you know Justice Roberts is trying to get there to be any kind of more brighter line drawn or boundary set, but I, it's hard to think that there isn't going to be something that kind of comes with that. But you know, Clarence Thomas is somebody who just doesn't care. <laughs> you know, like he will dig in, and he's, you know, he's not going to necessarily. He knows who his wife is. And he's not, uh, he, for him, this is not a surprise. And it's not that much of a surprise for people who've covered them as a couple for a very long time. We don't know what he thinks, right? Uh, in fact, <laughs> it's hard to know what he thinks almost ever because for a very long time, he never even asked a question at the Supreme Court. Um, he did write decisions. Um, and now he does actually ask a lot more questions uh, than he did for about 10 years. But uh, it's hard to know what he feels. I think if there were texts of his along those same lines, we'd certainly have a very different conversation. Hmm. Well, I guess Supreme Court justices don't need to text. That's, that's probably a big advantage for them. I think they still use big quill pens or something. Right? Yeah, right. <laughs> um, uh, you know, as long as we're, we're on the Supreme Court, uh, what about uh, Biden getting his nominee, uh, Katanji Brown Jackson, on the court? Uh, is that... Uh, is that going to help shore up his base? It's interesting. You know, it was a, a promise he made that he was going to put a black woman on the court. Um, and uh, I think that it probably will help him with a key uh, you know, pillar of the Democratic Party, which is black women. I mean, black women have voted, you know, almost nine in 10 for Democratic candidates in presidential elections and in almost every other election and they're reliable voters, they turn out to vote. And I think that this, you know, will probably help him at the margins uh, more so than, you know, uh, appealing to Republicans, for example, uh, which, uh, you know, obviously he's tried to do, but to little avail. All right. Uh, Bob in our audience uh, says, you've talked about uh, the two political philosophies toward government. Uh, one, it should help versus it should get out of the way. Which political leaders are best at articulating those perspectives? Not as sound bites or bumper stickers, but as a sort of a legitimate uh, way of looking at the world. Well, I, you know, I don't know if we're talking about dead or alive here, but um, you know, I do think that Ronald Reagan is the person who kind of invented this or not invented it, but invented it into the mainstream consciousness because of his speeches against government not being, you know, the answer, government being the problem. He did that at the convention, as we know, um, and I think really hammered home that idea. I think former President Obama is very, very good as well at making his arguments known for why government matters. I would love to see a Lincoln, Douglas, Obama, Reagan debate. I think they, <laughs> the two of them, you know, were probably, you know, the best at kind of pushing that ideology. You know, Obama, you know, I hesitate with ideology because I think he sees himself as a pragmatist, although, you know, he's pretty democratic, obviously he's pretty progressive. He, you know, Obama would say, I think he has written, that he would be as liberal as Congress would let him be. Um, you know, I think when he was arguing about the public option in Obamacare, that, you know, I'd love to have that, but I can't get the votes, right? And he tried and tried and tried and didn't have them, so didn't do it. But believes, and he said this the other day, if anybody watched him at the White House in the uh, ACA um, anniversary event, he said, you you have to believe in, uh, uh, you know, putting a down payment and building on something rather than thinking, of course, he always would say letting the perfect be the enemy of the good. But he's somebody who believes government needed to intervene when it came to health care and helping people get access to health care because there is a gap and there isn't this benevolent, you know, outside force that's going to help uh, people who can't have access. And, you know, Reagan would have argued completely the opposite of that. Uh, like we were talking about the philosophy of economics, which, you know, I think is something that he 
really started to talk about. I mean, I think Mario Cuomo was obviously gave a great speech in 1984 at that convention, which I think really started people's conversations about him potentially running 1988. till we saw the Hamlet on the Hudson stuff and how he sort of couldn't make a decision about it and whether or not, you know, what he was, you know, would be acceptable, um, you know, to a broad swath of people, I think was the issue for him. Um, but he was able to articulate what the Democratic Party could be when it was in the wilderness. So I don't know if that helps answer. I don't know who the Republican is now. There's a lot of them who are happy to make that argument and do it pretty articulately. I mean, you know, for as right wing as some Republicans come across, you know, I mean, Ted Cruz, Josh Hawley, these guys have Ivy League degrees. I mean, they went to Harvard Law School. Both of them did. You know, Mike Lee uh, from Utah, also a Harvard Law grad. Like these guys are um, very smart. You know, yeah. they know what their they know what their argument is. You know, and they know who they need to appeal to. You should talk to uh, Tom Emmer from Minnesota too. I, he did. He doesn't have the Ivy League degree, but he's a good communicator, and I think he could make that case pretty well. Yeah. Uh, let me ask you. Uh, sort of a final question. This came before we started from some listeners. Uh, society seems so polarized, so divided. Um, who, who can help fix that? Can journalists do it? Can politicians do it? Is it even uh, practical? Could it even be done? I get asked this all the time. And I, I always sound like the lord of darkness because i have very little confidence that people um, are sort of going to squeeze this mess back in the toothpaste tube and suddenly go you know be open-minded and listen to each other resort themselves to feel that oh i would be okay with my daughter dating somebody of a different party i mean those are eye-opening things when you see people saying that politics means that much to them that they wouldn't even like it if they're daughter or son married somebody of a different political persuasion than their parent. I mean, that is not something you used to see. It's just not. And it's far more hotly polarizing now. I think until and unless you crack down on lies and uh, the inability to um, agree on the same shared set of facts, uh, as long as there is this wide cacophony of a la carte um, information ecosystem that we have where I believe something link is going to tell me it's true or Fox news is going to tell me it's true. Uh, I think it's very difficult to then change that dynamic. I mean, we all have friends and relatives who um, maybe think differently uh, than us. And uh, you know, when people are ideological about it and aren't listening to facts and don't go about things like scientific method, right? Where, huh, I have a hypothesis. I think something is like this. And then I go look into it and I realize, oh, the facts tell me otherwise. That's not what's happening now. Now people are saying, it's like this. You know, it's like that. You know, these people give me a break. And it's like, you can't combat that, right? I mean, I think that we have to, you know, continue to show, I think that's why you've seen like through the Trump administration, for example, the Washington Post, 17 sources you know, in, a, in a story. I think that we have to be very careful as journalists to make sure that our facts are right, that we know the information is true, that we're saying that we independently verify the things that we put on um, and that we can back that up uh, and that the truth has to be our North Star. And I think as far as people go one-on-one, -on -one, we have to continue to try to see each other's humanity. Um, there are things we all do agree on um, in you know, whether or not we want our kids to have good educations or we want them to you know, uh, live happy, healthy, successful lives. How we get there is, is I think, the, the American story. And it's become just really hotly polarizing and difficult now. But I think it's more that we can see each other as people and not you know, uh, Twitter you know, reply, then uh, I think the better off we'll be. You know, Domenico, you really had me up until that answer. And now I've just, <laughs> I can't possibly agree with anything. I, no, just kidding. Uh, thanks so much for doing this. It's, You're it's, welcome. It's, it's been, been a, pleasure. a real pleasure. Thank you. I hope, uh, I hope I was able to answer uh, the questions uh, that people had and that you'll keep listening and that you'll give, give to Minnesota Public Radio. <laughs> All right.
I think that's going to do it for us. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. We really appreciate you, and we'll see you later.